Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And joining me here in the studio today is a man who's been among the leading filmmakers here in Germany for three decades and more now. And here he is, Adolf Winkelmann. Thank you very, very much for joining us today here on Talking Germany. You've come all the way from Dortmund today, yeah? Yeah. By train? By train. In spite of the terrible weather we've got here in Germany at the moment. Now, there is a lot I could tell you about our guest, but I suppose one of the most important things is that his movies are nearly always based in one specific part of Germany, and that is the Ruhr Valley region, and especially his hometown of, you've heard it already, Dortmund. Now, I've been a fan of Adolf Winkermann's since right back in the early 1980s. <laughs> We're going to be talking, we've mentioned it already, about your home region, your hometown, Dortmund and the Ruhr Valley. Let's just have a look at a, a map, first of all, and see just what that region looks like so that our viewers around the world can see where it lies in Germany. It's in the, it's in the northwest of Germany, quite close to the Dutch border. It's a very busy area. There's lots of cities, uh, dozens of cities, that make up this huge conurbation. There used to be lots of industry. There still is some. And so, Adolf Winkelmann, you tell me, what's so special about this region? <lacht> es sind eigentlich keine, äh, keine äh, vielen Städte. Es ist eigentlich eine große Stadt. It's not really a group of individual cities. It's more like one big city. 160 years ago, they started finding coal in what was at the time beautiful and remote countryside. It was home to a few farmers, but it was sparsely populated. Then a development set in over the last 160 years that got too quick for our minds to keep up with. Suddenly, there were six million people living there, although that has now gone back to five. So there was this rapid transformation into an industrial location, and then we stopped mining coal. We still have it in our heads that we're a mining region. But that's all gone now. And today we have to ask ourselves, why do we live there? There's no reason to live there anymore. <laughs> so there are five million people living in this huge conglomeration, and there's no reason for it anymore. You sound very jolly and optimistic about that, but that's a big problem. Yes, but that's true for other parts of the world as well. We're only just starting to think about what to do about it. These natural resources are no longer there. And it's actually a nice position to be in. To know that our last natural resource is our imagination. What we need is ideas. And if we really need ideas, then we have no choice but to come up with something. It's an interesting combination being a gritty filmmaker who makes films about working class themes and also being a professor of filmmaking at the same time. You started to experiment with film and camera at a very early age. Uh, how did that come about? How did that start? It all started when I was at university. While I was studying art, I developed an interest in photography. We had this great photography lecturer. And I think lots of people only find it natural that when you get into photography, you suddenly have this desire for the picture to move as well. The moving pictures. Okay, so the, then you moved into the field of moving pictures, and especially your early movies. They had, they really had working class themes. Are, are you from a working class family? Yeah. Uh huh. Well, t tell me about my, the background. My, my grandfather had. Uh, had my grandfather worked for Hirsch, that was the big steelworks in Dortmund. My father was a truck driver who worked for a haulage company. And they used to transport these steel slabs that were produced in the mill. And we lived in a working class part of the city. That's very interesting that you say that, yes, I came from a working class family, because very often people in Germany, compared with other countries, act as though Germ that class isn't very relevant to German society. Is class relevant? We don't have much to be proud of in the Ruhr Valley. We're proud of belonging there. Being a miner would be better. 
A steelworker is okay too. That's relevant and something to be proud of. In the Ruhr Valley, if you say you're a miner or a steelworker, you can say it with pride. Okay, so you're a, you're, you're a proud working class filmmaker. I, uh, realism is what you do. Is that, a, is that fair? Is that a, is that a, yeah, that's yeah? a good description. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's also why, as a filmmaker, I never moved to the capital, Berlin, or elsewhere, because I wanted to keep this direct connection with reality. Because my work is always about reality. And if that's what you want, the Ruhr Valley is a good place to be. All you have to do is open the front door, and you're right in the middle of the real world. I understand. Are you a typical or an untypical German filmmaker? On the one hand, I must admit that I am a typical filmmaker. But I've got other sides, too. I'm not just a filmmaker. Sometimes I suddenly take an interest in other formal or purely aesthetic or media technology issues, things my colleagues have no interest in. In that sense, I'm not typical. And uh, now I sense that you're talking as the, as the film professor. Professor Winkelmann, no? what, do you, what do you do as a film teacher? What's your priority? What are you teaching the youngsters? Nowadays I try to explain to my students that they need to think about the fact that the medium of film has changed, changed a lot. That since digitization, nothing is the way it used to be. That film has left those places where it used to be at home, in cinemas, on TV and now flies around the world somewhere in the public arena and suddenly shows up on my cell phone and inevitably on the internet. So I tell them they have to think about films in public spaces, not just in cinemas. And of course they have to think about films in the digital cloud. Interesting stuff. Uh, now, in our first report, we saw that a lot of Adolf Winkelmann's films, especially his early films, uh, take, took place in the Ruhr Valley. They had that area as their backdrop. Uh, more recently, he's won plaudits and awards for a two-part TV movie called Kontergan in German. That's thalidomide in English. It's a critical dramatization of the thalidomide scandal uh, from back in the early 1960s. <laughs> It was a painful film, a painful subject. Yeah. Why did you choose it? I experienced that as a child and as a youth. As a child, I saw that suddenly there were other kids on the street who had no arms and no legs. Die keine Arme und keine really? Beine hatten. Ja. I'm going back, you were born in 1946. I was born in 1946, and that was around 1960, 1959. Yeah. So you were a 14-15 year old? Yeah. And you, you can remember und kids? Das, ja, und ich kann das sehr gut yes, erinnern. I remember it well. And it was a special time for me. When you're 15, 16, 17 years old, you have a special way of seeing the world. Mit besonderen Augen auf die Welt schaut. What did you think when you saw those kids at that time? At that time, I thought, why is this? It's not a nice thing to see. Why are they out on the streets? That was something I had just copied from the adults. And when I got older, I was ashamed of having seen things that way. And then at some stage, you decided to make the movie. Uh, did you did you have the feeling that you were taking a risk with the movie? It, it was a risk. Nein, eigentlich nicht. No, not really. Because I couldn't believe what happened afterwards with the film. At some stage, the producer, Michel Souvenier, who was once a student of mine, by the way, said there's going to be trouble. They'll never let us release the film. And I said, you're crazy. We even made a bet. Okay, so you're saying, he said there would be trouble. He said there'd be yes. anger, there'd be trouble. Yeah. There yeah. was. There yeah. was trouble. Yeah. <laughs> big trouble. Yeah, big trouble. <laughs> but tell me, I mean, uh, the, you had problems with the company that made the drug. 
Uh, and then the, the whole matter went, uh, the, the German law was rewritten as a result of the movie. But there's one, uh, the, the one thing I was asking you about in terms of risk is that you're, you're dealing with emotions that are very, very sensitive. When you were making the film, how did you know that you were dealing with those emotions properly? <laughs> Das kann man als, als Filmregisseur während der Arbeit That's something a film director can't know while shooting the film, regardless of the subject. I rely on my perception, and I work with my actors, and I look at them and try to correct them by acting as their mirror, by telling them how I see it. But basically I have to rely on my intuition to get it to work the way I'd like it to. Intuition verlassen und uh, mm -hmm. dann denke ich, so muss you es have, you, you had the young girl, you had the young girl in the movie who was a, a sufferer, not of the same complaint. But did did what was it like working with her? Das uh, das war ja Arbeit mit einer Laien Darstellung. I was working with an amateur actress, which is something I did a lot in my earlier films. It was a very good experience. It was lovely working with her. Afterwards, I had to have half of her lines dubbed over because she had a southern German accent and the film was set in Cologne. She rolled her R's like only the southern Germans can. And then I found a girl with a voice that was almost identical to hers and all I had to do was dub the lines where she rolled her arms. And because this girl had no arms and just one leg, I didn't want to take her voice away as well. I wanted her to recognize herself and her own voice. You have to be very careful about things like that. Throughout the making of the film, there were very sensitive situations. And that's not unusual in the film business. But in this case, there were many instances in which the consequences could have been terrible if I'd got it wrong. Okay, fascinating observations there. Let's go back now to the area we've been focusing on throughout the show. And 2010, what a special year it was for the Ruhr Valley, which got a huge opportunity to showcase itself after it was chosen as the first entire region to be one of the European cultural capitals. You, Adolf Finkelmann, you've been very much involved in the whole cultural capital programme. Has it been a success? It clearly has, and how has it been a success? The most important aspect of this European capital of culture, this year of being capital of culture, in terms of homemade success, is that the people who live in Dortmund, in Essen, in Gelsenkirchen, can get a new self-image, a new perspective on our own cities. And that image that you have of your cities and yourselves is das das ist nicht mehr bei uns so aussieht dass das best thing is that it no longer looks like it used to there's no soot floating on the puddles the sky is no longer so dark and gray that the sun doesn't get through it seems some people used to think everybody in the Ruhr Valley lived underground and the stuff overground was just props and that's all gone now and we're left with the feeling that we have more to be proud of than our working-class roots. <laughs> that we now have other reasons to be proud. And I think when you have that kind of feeling, you can express it outwardly. So the likes of Bavaria and Berlin can start changing their perception of the Ruhr Valley. Because most people have a false perception of where I come from. Uh -huh. And are you confident that this, that this new positive self-perception that people have, this way of looking at themselves, is that going to last? Because this big cultural festival is going to move on. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Our year as the capital of culture is over. And what's left is that we have a new perception of ourselves and new confidence in ourselves. 
And that's very important because so far we haven't really understood developments. We don't really know whether we're already back up or is industry about to decline or is it already in decline or have we already hit rock bottom? Whereabouts are we in the development process? We've learned a few things this year, but that's about all. Okay, okay. Um, I'll tell you another thing that immediately comes to mind when you start to think about the Ruhr region, and that is football, soccer. Uh, the passion for the game is, I can tell you, massive, and the rivalries are intense, and the top dogs at the moment are, without a doubt, Borussia Dortmund. <laughs> And Adolf Winkelmann is, I believe, a Dortmund fan. Yeah? Yeah. You've, you go to the stadium? Yeah. Regularly? Yeah. You jump up and down? Oh. Yeah? When it's cold. When it's cold. You go into, the, into, the, into that stand where all the, where all the, the, the real it's fans are? Or you are, are you a, a, a formerly working class privileged uh, football goer? Yeah. I don't go on the terraces anymore. Oh, it's too much effort. I used to go there a lot. I would love to go there. But now I go somewhere where I can sit down. Oh, yeah. I've been to lots of the top stadiums in Germany, in Hamburg and in Frankfurt and in, in, here in Berlin and the arena in Munich, but I've never been to, uh, to the Dortmund ground. I must go. How far is it from Dortmund to another city in the area, Gelsenkirchen? How far? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. There are people for whom it's almost a religion. <laughs> and you simply cannot penetrate this other city, this suburb of Gelsenkirchen. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's explain for the, for the viewers at home. There's Dortmund, yeah, and then there's the city of Gelsenkirchen, just down the road. Their football team is Schalke. Yeah? Um, what do you say about Schalke? Schalke is a good club, but it's not my club. Mm -hmm. I don't belong to this religious cult which says you can't touch or wear something that is blue and white and has Schalke written on it, or even have it in the same room. I don't subscribe to that. But I'm still up for Borussia Dortmund. I mean, you're playing it down a little bit. Between Dortmund and Schalke, there's something like hatred very often. Yeah, yes, for sure. Why? I, I never understand that. I'm a big football fan. I never understand this tribalism. Well, these are two relatively equal football clubs with similar histories. They live cheek by jowl and in the same region. And it's almost a form of civil war. And civil wars are often the worst. Okay, okay. Schalke are not doing very well at the moment, at least in the Bundesliga. Dortmund are doing very well. Are Dortmund going to win the Bundesliga? Yes. Oh yeah, for sure. Why? Give me one reason why the team is so good. Das team is nicht this team was not put together with millions of euros. Most of them are players who came up through our ranks and did their apprenticeships here. Or they're still young. It's the youngest team in the league. And they've got this spirit you just can't compare. <laughs> you can tell he is a Borussia Dortmund fan. He's talked so much that we don't have time for our traditional quiz, but who's going to miss it after that? Fantastic observations from Adolf Winkelmann, the filmmaker. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, come back next week. Tschüss. Bye-bye. <laughs>